Okay, good evening. Today is Tuesday, June 6. I want to welcome you to the 1,457th meeting of this uh, uh, committee to discuss this uh, item. Uh, we have one item on today's uh, agenda, so why don't I kick it over to the clerk, you read the item, and then we get started. Item number one is motion Wesson Koritz Martinez et al. and City Administrative Officer and Chief Legislative Analyst Joint and Individual Reports relative to Proposition D, Medical Cannabis Dispensaries, Adult Use of Marijuana Act. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk, very much. Anyway, today we have a, a, a panel where we're going to have a conversation from the uh, uh, county's health department, and we have two testing facilities so that uh, we can uh, educate ourselves on those issues and ask a series of questions and answers. For those of you that is, have been with us through the duration of these hearings, I want you to know that we hope to within the next several days put out a draft uh, of all of the regulations. You'll be given a 60-day period in which you can comment on these uh, proposed regs. And I just want to emphasize that it is a draft. It is proposed, and we want to get it out there. And we, we do very much want to hear back from you. I am uh, joined today by my colleague uh, Marquise Harris Dawson. We do have a quorum, Mr. Clerk, so why don't we get it started? And I think what we'll do, we will start off with uh, the representative from the uh, health department. If you could come forward, I met him earlier. I met another health department guy earlier. Either, e either I met another guy earlier or you just turned African American on us. <laughs> either way, bless you and we're glad that you're here. And I want to say that on a very serious note, that all of the, the cities and the states have really jumped in to try to assist us at the city of LA. And I really want you to know that uh, I know that there are a lot of other things that you could be doing, but you agreed to come here and, you know, just share uh, your thoughts and do a presentation. So on behalf of Mr. Harris Dawson and myself, I want you to know that it's really appreciated and welcome to uh, City Hall. Thank you. And thank you for inviting us. So how do you want to start this? It's, uh, I think we have a PowerPoint. So you want to go through, why don't you just identify what, yeah, well, I can say you, Freddie. Yes, I, I just am. I'm going to let you do the last name, and then we'll put Andrew on the, uh, uh, Andrew's already there. We can start the, uh, the PowerPoint. Anyway, wait a minute. So Marquise just laughed at me <laughs> because I didn't want to try to deal with the last name. So why don't you say it? You're the chair. All right. <laughs> All right, welcome. Thank you, and try getting old, it's aging. Aging, I can do that, Let Freddie Agent, Freddie Agent. Yes, sir. Like, I sound like a singer, Freddie Agent. That's a nice ring and, the, and the Matadors. <laughs> so anyway, welcome, uh, Mr. Agent, we do appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, so I, I just have a little overview just to share with you what the uh, county and uh, particular public health is doing. Thank you. As we get ready for the implementation and regulation of the cannabis. So uh, LA County will be generally responsible for implementing and enforcing cannabis regulations in unincorporated areas and within contract cities. Uh, LA County Office of Cannabis Management is the coordinating body for LA County agencies and is working with LA City staff and other cities in the region to develop best practices and promote consistency. LA County Department of Public Health is responsible for enforcing health and safety codes and implementing public health policies affecting all areas of the county, among other things. 
LA County Department of Public Health, Division of Environmental Health, which is where my expertise lies, will likely be responsible for plan check, plan review, uh, inspection of cannabis businesses from a health perspective, ensuring proper sanitation, public safety, and product recalls and enforcement activities. Public health, as you know, uh, is the health officer for all cities of LA County except the city of Long Beach, city of Vernon, and city of Pasadena. Uh, other departments that may be enforcing rules within the contract cities include uh, county fire and hazmat, county public and uh, building and safety, county business licensing, uh, county department of consumer and public affair, uh, business affairs, and on my presentation, it's not on that, the sheriff may be another one too for contract cities. A public health role in implementation of Prop 64 and the medical cannabis will include community education and prevention messaging, policy development and advocacy, surveillance, health equity, quality standards, and safety. So on the community education and prevention messaging, uh, Public Health is working in collaboration with other county departments, cities, schools, communities, stakeholders to increase education, prevention, treatment for cannabis abuse and addiction. They're also working to provide accurate, unbiased, culturally competent public health messaging and education about cannabis use. Also developing strategies to reduce access to minors. On policy development and advocacy, we're working to develop policies that limit over-commercialization of cannabis, develop policies that limit advertising and media marketing in areas of high exposure to youth, develop policies that create incentives for business, cannabis businesses to address inappropriate consumption and negative impact in communities. On surveillance, we're working to train, uh, look at trends in adult and youth use, worked on impact on health care and health outcomes, do surveillance on knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about cannabis use, and impact to communities. On health equity front, we're working on looking at disproportionate impact of use, sale, and cultivation of cannabis in low-income communities of color. Uh, working on promotion of smoke-free policies to from, uh, from the dangers of secondhand smoke while also addressing public consumption issues, like not having a place to smoke. For example, living in an apartment that uh, you may not be allowed to smoke inside, and where does the person go and smoke? Uh, and a public equity, uh, equity issue, we're looking at public health approach to cannabis policies and ensure the health and safety of county residents while treating substance use addiction as a chronic disease. Quality standards and safety, we're looking at testing and quality control mechanisms to make sure the products are safe, provide consumer information to cannabis products, work with the state, other counties, cities, local agencies, and industry on enforcement of health code and other cannabis regulations. DPH, environmental health role and responsibility that we're looking at dispensaries and adult use retail facilities, distribution facilities where most of this product will come from before they go to dispensaries manufacturing and extraction processes, cultivation facilities, and in particular, the plumbing. That is what environmental health is interested. We want to make sure uh, the portable water is safe. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, do complaint investigation. On the uh, proposed regulations, that has been 
on the table right now from the state, uh, the three departments. We are reviewing and providing comments on the proposed state regulations. Uh, the review include retail, distribution, manufacturing, cultivation, and lab testing. Uh, we're providing comment through the state, through our LA County Office of Cannabis Management, which in turn will provide uh, our comments to the State Department. Thank you. Look, thank you. Um, I'm just curious as to the, the contract cities where it relates to the relationship between them and the county. How is that going to work? The county will provide all of the services or what have you and then the charge the 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 cities or so similar to our food uh, our restaurant oh because when we start talking edibles dispensaries and all that you know it's going to be similar to food we can call it food we call it edible because it has tac and it's a schedule one drug and really that's the difference but if you have a cookie that's it's infused with TAC, it's still somebody's gonna eat that product. So we're looking at doing something similar to how we do with the food. Now, are, are, are they having hearings over at the county trying to figure out the best approach to deal with the unincorporated areas? And, and who's leading those efforts? Is that a health effort or? So what? our Office of Cannabis Management is leading that effort and coordinating amongst all the county when agencies. When did you guys start that office? And it's housed out of? A, a CEO's office. Okay. So they're in contact with the country city. So to answer your question, one of the things we're working on is coming off an ordinance that will be in contact with the cities and they can adopt the ordinance by reference. So then that will give us the cities that wants to do it, give us authority to come in similar to how we do with our food restaurant to do that inspection. Are there conversations going on with uh, the, you guys and the sheriffs where it relates to new training methods or? Yes, the, the office of our uh, Cannabis management have a work groups that are working on, on permitting, enforcement, and all those groups are involved. Has any action up to this date been taken by the uh, the soups, the supervisors? Yes, that natural that charge. That's how the office of cannabis management came about. Okay. Was the supervisors directing to form that to make sure that we're consistent. How unique is it going to be? You indicated that uh, you know we have all of. LA County, but will there be a unique relationship with Long Beach, Pasadena, and Vernon, or just? Yes, when we are in contact with all of them. You know, because I would hope that we would try to be as uniform as, as, as possible. Yes, and we, we actually have a work group that they participate in. You know, you said something, and, and I think it was under surveillance and it dealt with trends of adult and youth yeah trends in adult and youth use how will you go about monitoring so currently uh, the office of cannabis management is collecting data trying to get a baseline on on use so some of them is a survey they're doing a county survey to get that and then start monitoring. So I have a baseline and as they monitor, when we implement the regulations, hopefully trying to see what is going on and then using the baseline, we can see, you know, is, is the use going up? And this is something that actually was done in Denver. Denver did something similar where they do those trend analysis. So we're looking at all the best practices that's out there. Because so if I can, remember, Denver is a, it's a city, city slash county, county right? Yes. And capital. Mr. Harris Dawson, did you have a? Thank you. I uh, wanted to follow up on uh, something the chair uh, asked about with relationship uh, to the food inspection. 
So uh, the chair asked about contract cities, and I'm just wondering about cities in general. So he, even in the city of LA, if I think a grocery store is unsanitary, I call the county, yes. and they send someone. Uh, is it your opinion that that's how it's going to work uh, with regard to, to these new businesses? Yes, and that's how we're proposing it. And the big difference, just to put on, on the food side, the county, as, as a health, health office on our code, gives the county that authority to do that work. So we do contract the cities to do that. On the uh, Prop 64 and the medical, it really didn't explicitly give that authority. So what we work in is work with the cities and we work on the state as they're going through the trailer bill to make changes to see how we can make that correction. But to answer your question, yes, we will contact the cities to let them know even there's a gap, see how we can maybe have it as a contract to do and, that and, work. And it's, uh, it sounds like this might not have been decided yet, but uh, is it your opinion that that will be similar to the way it is with food so the a resident doesn't have to call city to call the county the resident can call the county directly that's the goal especially okay. if they have to do with 88 cities okay. or 85 that would be very yeah um and then the second uh my second line of inquiry is about uh so it was about 10 years ago that we did medical marijuana uh and i'm wondering does the county have are you familiar with any data the county has about addiction overdose uh anything like that i know i know department of health alcohol and drug programs keeps pretty good data for uh, those kinds of things. Did, was there a spike in uh, leveling off or what impact did medical, the legalization of medical use have? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that. That's our substance abuse, but I can have them get, you get back to you. On, yeah. And then um, the, 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 I guess this is another question maybe for somebody from ADPA. Uh, what is the sort of treatment load? Uh, so of the resources that you all, that the county puts out around substance abuse treatment and education, uh, how much of it have you seen fit to use on and cannabis I don't in have the details, but what I know is so what group's going on looking into all of that and uh -huh. how to tackle that, how to get funding for that, uh, either through the state, through the county, through country cities. So those, I, at this stage, there's, we have multiple work groups working on all this to kind of bring different it together. Working aspects of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there conversations about some kind of uh, program that you're aware of to ensure that there is a minority or social equity in the unincorporated area of the county of L.A.? I, I know that is the conversation of work group working on that for density areas and all that on, and the impact of it, yes. And but I don't know if it's a program, but I know it's being discussed. Okay, so, but that comes out of the CAO's office and that the new division that was created, what is the Office of Cannabis Management. And part of it too, be public health in general. What is your timeline as to when you think the county's operation would be up and, and, and running? My understanding, we're really working, there's a st sequences that's going to happen, but the way it, I've looked at the timeline is at least by June. Really? Of this next, year. yeah, okay. next year, which we should be able to, able to go because we're working through the ordinances, we need to get approved, we need to talk to the cities. So, but in between there may be some processes to get other business to start operating while we're getting everything together. But I, I think that is the timeline and I, I, that, that may change. And, and you're satisfied at this point with the working relationship with the city? with the city of Los Angeles. We are, I yes. mean, in order for this to work, we have to be as close to on the same page as possible. And I know of our Office of Cannabis Management is very, working very close over the city. Well, I wanna thank you and ask if you could just maybe stick around a little 
a little longer because uh, there I'm, I'm sure there'll be a question or two that uh, comes up and again I can't uh, tell you how much we appreciate you coming by this is uh, you know I hate to admit it the first time that I've had a formal conversation with uh, the county of Los Angeles had a lot of informal conversations so I've learned a lot and my comfort level is elevated in seeing that uh, at least it looks as though we want to really we recognize the importance of working together so I, I, I think that that's uh, critical so at this point I th it would appear to me we're moving in the right direction Mr. Harris Dawson okay so why don't we I want to call I want to do some public comments and then we're going to bring up the reps from the lab You know what name I'm gonna call first. <laughs> do I have to do I have to call you or can you just walk on down because you you know <laughs> told me here. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for having me tonight and for having this. Um, one of the things that the, the city has mentioned a lot is equity. And uh, under the proposed regulations from the state, at least for the manufacturing, it looks like it's going to be very, very difficult for the lower the minorities to get in the business. The main reason, I think, is the fact that two licensees cannot share the same location, the same kitchen. Uh, the probably the uh, cost for getting a, a place certified for manufacturing will be far too expensive for anyone without a huge backing to, uh, to get into the business. Um, I don't know how much of that you guys have control over, but it's something that I know the city cares about and I think you should be aware of it. Um, on the testing level, I know that as a manufacturer, uh, one of the things that has been very difficult for me is to get consistent lab testing from different locations. Uh, I've been through testing from several states and many, many different labs. At one point or another, each one of them gave me results that were inconsistent with what I was expecting. And it got to a point where now I test everything through two or potentially even three different labs before I can be assured that what I'm seeing, the results that I'm getting are okay. actually accurate. Okay, let me ask you this. If you had to recommend to us another hearing or what we should uh, discuss, because I believe you've been at every meeting that, uh, you know, the 2,000 meetings that we've had, I think you've been to every one. So if there's any suggestion, and for the rest of you that come up, there's a suggestion for this committee, feel free. But do you have one, should well, an <clears throat> area we haven't touched on, something else? I think the, in the micro business license and the, the ability to give people of, again, minorities the ability to work with that license and either create lounges or things that doesn't require as much state regulation but still allows them to operate within the cannabis world. And not, looking at it a little bit differently, not having the you know, 600 feet limit between two of them because if you have a yoga studio and a spa that are next door and they both want to offer some sort of cannabis treatments in there, there really shouldn't be anything that would prevent it from happening. And um, I think that that's something where, the, the, like I said, that the, the uh. minorities would be able to um, potentially either get a loan for or be able to start that on their own as a cottage business. Um, and I hear you. It, it, land use for that would be. Okay, proper. let's, let's, and, Thank hey, you. and I, I appreciate you coming to every hearing. I, I do get a kick out of messing with you, but I do. I appreciate your participation and I've learned a lot from you. Victoria Thank Chamberlain, you. Matt Haskin. Donnie, you're on the list too, Mr. Anderson. Evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Victoria Chamberlain. Uh, I'm a Crohn's disease patient. I've been living with Crohn's disease since I was 12 years old. I'm now 25. Uh, I am also part of a tremendous educational platform all about cannabis based right here in Los Angeles. So I felt compelled to come speak here um, to you guys specifically about impending regulations about edibles that we are seeing uh, moving forward with edible cannabis. 
To make it brief, I have put myself into remission with my Crohn's disease because of edible cannabis. I only did so after I lost my health insurance, had no option but cannabis to turn to, and through a lot of the people just in this room actually with their products, I've found relief, and I know there are a lot of patients like myself who seek that relief through edible cannabis. Some of the regulations that are suggested, like a 100 milligram, 100 milligram cap on edibles, uh, no dairy, no caffeine, things like that, Taking away those options will, I promise you, force patients like myself into other options that are either not affordable or not legal. And I would hate to see that happen. So I just strongly urge you guys to look at the current edible regulations, think about it, and realize that everybody in this room, especially, we are responsible and we will take the initiative to educate the rest of the world on that. So Thank you. Thank you. Matt? Good evening, man. Good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Haskin. I'm with CannaSafe Analytics, or Cannabis Laboratory, um, established in 2011. Um, just maybe a couple of things I'd like to really encourage the city to look at as they're establishing their testing laboratory ordinances is really ensuring this, speaking to Tamir's point as well, is the reproducibility of results. And part of the reproducibility is the quality management systems that are underlying the laboratory's overall systems and protocols. And the way to do that is through an accreditation, which is an ISO 17025 accreditation for laboratories. Um, it is a state requirement, although the state is allowing a provision that would give laboratories up to possibly 18 months before um, attaining the accreditation. So what I would recommend to the city here is that in their ordinance they would require that ISO accreditation because therefore it underlies all the quality management and it addresses the reproducibility of lab results that is a big issue in the industry. Um, the other point I would just try to make, if I may, thank you, um, is the state also has um, proposed a, a waiver for testing up to a year. So until 2019, um, it may not be required to test the products. I think that's extremely irresponsible on the state's behalf. Um, and I would encourage the city as well to, to require that all the products that are, you know, either cultivated or manufactured in the city to be tested as required by state and hopefully city, you know, ordinances and regulations and, and not allow a one-year waiver and potentially, um, you know, expose patients that we just heard from to, you know, unnecessary toxins and harmful contaminants. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, but I wanted to bring Matt up because I introduced Matt to Governor Brown about three years ago about the testing. He's the first laboratory in the nation that's ISO uh, certified testing. And that's the interim, what is that, Matt? ISO. Yeah, ISO 17025. But what it is is... Oh, yeah, like, I know what that Yeah, is. for sure you do. <laughs> but we want to make sure that everything is tested before anything is get given out. Because you give a patient that's dealing with cancer something that haven't been tested, that can hurt or kill them. So we want to make sure that L.A. is on top of it with the testing. Thank you. Well, that makes a lot of sense uh, to me as well. Okay, so why don't we... Uh, move into the testing presentation. And um, where, I just, if you guys would come on up, is it uh, Alta? Anybody else gonna come up with him? Do we have the other? We have them both? Well, come on down. Good to see you. So again, I want to thank uh, both of you for coming. I just thought that as we were going through this series of hearings, that it made sense that at least one of the hearings we have a conversation about testing and 
you know, not only how important it is, but exactly how it works. So I, I would like to defer uh, to you if you have a presentation. And I think Alta does, right? You're Alta. Yes, I do. So why don't we start with, with you, if you just identify yourself. And again, on behalf of this committee, we thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the committee for taking the time to give us the opportunity to participate on, on, on this topic. My name is Jose Zavaleta, and I am the lab director for Altasai Laboratories. Our company is based out of New Britain, Connecticut, but as you will see shortly, our roots are definitely here in Los Angeles. Before we get started, allow me to give you a quick overview of my you know talk what, today. You know, you, you, you know what, Jose, if it's yes, okay sir. with you, I want to ask, in fact, both of you. Let's say we, if, if a question comes up, can I just stop you and ask the question? I'll let you get through that, that page. And so you indicated that you're HQ'd where? Uh, New, New Britain, Britain, Connecticut, yes. But you work, you, so I, so where are, are your labs? Our lab's in New Britain, Connecticut, but we started the company here in Los Angeles. Okay, so continue. Okay, thank you. So um, it started here? It started here. Okay. And um, so uh, real quick, the outline for the presentation, I'm gonna go over the company background, which will address why we're in Connecticut and Los Angeles right yeah. now. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the status of uh, the cannabis testing lab. Um, I'll go over what I call the gap analysis of, of that overview of the cannabis testing in the US and then um, discuss how industry and government offices can work together. Go right ahead. Next slide, please. So even though I, I titled this slide the problem, it really describes the situation under which we decided to pursue this venture in cannabis testing. Um, when we began, we noticed that as states legalized cannabis used for either medical or, pers or uh, recreational use in, uh, around the country, uh, we noticed that some of that had to be tested, either all or, um, or some part of that production. And quality control tested uh, in order to ensure product safety and efficacy. However, that brings up issues. So the first issue was that the country overall face was that federal government prohibits marijuana usage. Therefore, states could unfortunately not turn to the FDA for guidance in setting up rules and regulations for QC tests. What does that mean? That means that all DEA licensed laboratories such as toxicology, pharmacology, environmental laboratories that hold a DEA license are not allowed and are barred from servicing the marijuana testing market because of the conflict of interest. And the newly, and the few licensed, and I put that in quote, licensed third party labs in existence are having difficulty working with states to set harmonized testing standards. What does that mean? That means that the current laboratories are either not equipped um, or not suitable or don't have suitable testing methods to meet quality control state regulations. Overall, we realize that leaves public vulnerable to low quality and unsafe marijuana products. Next slide. So with that in mind, we decided to so enter Let me ask you, yep. because of the issues federal government and all and is there like a, a, a standard within the testing lab community? Things that, you know, like if I send it to your lab, you're gonna check A, B, C, D. I ch send it to your lab, you're gonna check those very same things? Or do I get a different test from a different lab? It depends on state by state, what the state requires. So the state of California is definitely requiring something different from the state of Maryland or Delaware or Hawaii. But technically, if you were to send your sample within the state to two different labs, you should get same, the, the same testing on, on the same sample. Okay. 
Um, so here, here we go. Um, we were actually first called Pure Analytics, but IBM holds a trademark for that, so we decided to let that be for obvious reasons. We don't want to mess with IBM. And in business, just like in marriage, you must know how to pick your battle, so we decided to change our name to AltaSci. Um, in 2012, Armin, Jason, and myself began to conduct potency and pesticide testing for collectives around Los Angeles. And after about a thousand tests that we have con conducted, we concluded that a lot of the marijuana being sold in terms of both potency and pesticide contamination was not what the sellers thought. Without putting anybody on the spot, we tested samples that were contaminated hundreds and even thousands of times higher than what the EPA would allow on a food commodity. So, due to the in insurmountable pushback from collectives, as you can imagine, we decided that our efforts were better spent in a market that actually required testing on products and thus decided to take our R&D results um, to Connecticut. So in Connecticut, we uh, obtained a drug control license in 2013, um, first of such license in the US. Um, really? Yes, uh, Connecticut actually designed their regulations to allow a third-party uh, marijuana testing lab to be a control substance laboratory. And after um, we conducted uh, over 20,000 R&D tests to get ready for the program, so that 20,000 obviously includes the, the tests that we conducted here in California and in Connecticut. And the 20,000 tests include all the way from pesticide potency, microbiology, myco uh, mycotoxins, and all of that. Um, we collaborated with the Department of Consumer Protection and the Health Department to set standards for heavy me t testing methodologies, actually, for heavy metals, pesticides, microbial, uh, water activity, and um, storage and handling of baked goods. And now we provide testing services to three of the four production facilities in Connecticut. How oh, many do they have total? Four. So we test for three of the four in Connecticut. Uh, in Florida, we submitted initial public comments to health department in 2014. We have participated in multiple stakeholder meetings. Um, we also helped draft the testing regulations for Amendment 2, which is the uh, amendment that passed last November that opens the medical marijuana program um, to a wider um, audience. And now we provide testing services to CHT Medical also in um, in Florida, Gainesville, Florida. So as I look back, uh, so these are the microbial, these are the tests that we provide. We provide the whole battery of tests, microbial, mycotoxins, water activity, pesticides, heavy metals, residual solvent, terpene, terpenes, and cannabinoids. Hey, suppose you find, like you referenced earlier, finding something that was contaminated or tainted or whatever the correct term is, so what do you do? You found something that is, you know, so you, what's, what's, what is your process after that? In, the Connecticut regulations require that we submit those test results to the Department of Consumer Protection and then they take care of, of so whatever. So then you submit it to them. Yes. And then they talk or go out they, to the. Right. The production facility as I understand it, has the opportunity to remediate the product or to extract it, or if they don't think it's worth either or, they can destroy it. So the business folk, do they come to you? Not just the government. Do you test for if Donnie had a lab and he wanted you to test it, would you test it? Or how does, do you, you know... So the production facility calls our lab. We do the sampling at the production facility. We bring back the samples and we do the testing. Okay, so you inform the production folk of the result. Yes. So we as have to, you would inform the government as well. Right, the Department of Consumer Protection. Um, next slide, please. So real quick tour of our lab. Um, our lab is uh, BSL2 certified. 
uh, to handle the organisms that we test for. We conduct all of our tests under USP 1111, which makes the products sold in Connecticut pharmaceutical grade. Um, we test for total aerobic microbial count, total yeast and mold, and we look for specific organisms as well, gram-negative staph and pseudomonas. We also test for five different mycotoxins, and we also uh, test for water activity for edible products. In the inorganic laboratory, we test for heavy metal contamination. Uh, we test for the big four, candium, lead, mercury, and arsenic. And finally, in our organic chemistry lab, uh, we test for cannabinoid contact analysis, which is the potency. Uh, we use HPLC, we use GCMS for terpene content and residual solvent, and we use MSMS for pesticide residue analysis. And I have to give props to my team. Um, as you can see, all of them are, most of them are UConn grads. Um, they all hold either a bachelor's or a master's degree. Uh, actually, Lim Bin Zhang holds a PhD in uh, botany, who works in the inorganic chemistry lab. So overall, our mission is to deliver accurate and expeditious results to our customers to apply by applying high-tech analytical tools and technologies, employing highly qualified personnel and focusing on patient safety, consumer ser uh, customer service, research, and education. So, status of the cannabis testing in the U.S. Um, as I look back to where I thought the testing arena was when we opened our lab in, in Connecticut and what it is now, it is unfortunate that much, n not much has changed. Um, as you can see, this is the, the, um, a recent map of where you got, we can find any uh, either medical or recreational um, marijuana laws and regulations. And on the left, it's, it's, so the total is about 29 states plus the District of Columbia. The red on the left signals every state where there is either no testing required or the testing is so vague that it's just not doable. Um, on the right, it's yellow. And I'll be honest, Connecticut is a yellow because they don't require ISO 70. They don't require third-party accreditation of the lab. But you can see most of the country, it's either red or yellow. There's very few places where it's green, where it's testing is required, where it, the lab has to be accredited, and there's a, a solid and very focused uh, regulations on what needs to be tested and when needs to be tested. So with that so in mind... So there's only five jurisdictions that have those requirements out of the yeah. country? Um, I, I, this is William Waldrop. I'm CEO of uh, Evio Labs. I, I hey. do adjustment that Oregon actually does require third-party independent accredited testing. Uh, ORLAP is a subsidiary of the Oregon Health Authority, and all labs within the state of Oregon to operate have to be accredited. No, not only to standards 17025, but they also need to be accredited to the aspect of competency and potency and uh, proficiency mm -hmm. to perform specific tests. Um, so I did want to make that minor clarification. Apologize. Uh, thank you for that. Um, next slide, please. So. With, with that in mind, um, w we have to take an earnest look at, at where the testing um, standards are around the country. Um, next slide, please. So I think what, uh, what we think is missing is one lack of defined parameters. Um, for example, sampling guidelines, uh, batch size guidelines, and frankly, standards. What, what are labs supposed to use? US, U, USDA, FDA, uh, USP, or herbal pharmacopoeia? Uh, there's a lot of jurisdictions around the country that don't make that, that, that distinction. Um, and quite honestly, lack of accountability on the labs and on, on 
because there's no third party accreditation, um, like we've been hearing from the beginning, no ISO 17025 or NELAP. I mean, th there has to be some sort of um, accountability. Um, and so let me jump in. So if I've owned a lab, I could operate without, uh, nobody would be required to sign off on the operation of my? It, it depends on, on, on where the jurisdiction, I... absolutely. Um, and also communication deficiencies, I think um, inter-lab um, proficiency testing, that's definitely um, not happening because for some reason we think that labs are competing when we shouldn't, we should be working together. Um, there's no communication between labs and grower slash producer. Um, in terms of training, there's no, in a lot of jurisdictions, we don't see quality control training, making a distinction, what's the difference between quality control and quality assurance. I guarantee you that you go around the country and you talk to, to a lot of labs, I'm not saying all of them, but most of labs, are, are not going to know what the difference are, the difference is, and and another thing, education. I feel like I've been to a lot of what seems you know they they get advertised as scientific conferences for cannabis, but it's all just a a place where vendors get together and try to sell you products. So not a lot of education is happening at the conferences and seminars. Um, but um, it's not all bad. Well, I was like, can I make a comment in yeah. regards to the last statement? Um, one thing in California, there is a group called the Association of Commercial Cannabis Labs. And it is a organization, not-for-profit uh, body of companies such as Steep Hill, SC Labs, uh, Farm Labs, uh, and others who have come together and are working specifically to address some of the concerns that Jose has mentioned, and that is ensuring that labs have standardized processes, standardized methods, uh, working together to ensure that the state is, um, and this goes to you know, later meeting later in the week, the state has testing protocols that are in place that will benefit and safeguard the public without. So there are groups that are working towards this end, but there's nothing in it, stone it, as of yet. No, well, they're, yeah, they're working together collectively, labs working collectively together through the association to present to the state so we can okay. ensure as we're all on the same perspective, safeguarding, you know, public safety. Okay. Uh, question, Mr. Chair, just before Jump you, go, you all go on. Uh, so you're describing this sort of loose and uh, sometimes competitive environment um, where there isn't a lot of coordination. There certainly is, there aren't standards across the board. What's your sense of the... So what I would call the so what, right? So what are the implications of that? What are the, both the potential implications and then what are sort of anecdotes that have actually happened that, that have been reported? Uh, that's actually a really good question. I think that the so what translates to a race to the bottom. If we don't have standards, if we don't have accountability, if we don't have counties going and doing unannounced auditing of a testing laboratory, you're gonna get a race to the bottom because if there's no one watching, there's, you know, th the industry is so used to going to the highest bidder in terms of who's gonna give me the highest THC number. And we're, we, I'll be honest with you, we're seeing it in Connecticut. Who's gonna give me the, the highest THC number? So without accountability, without, any checks and balances without those unannounced audits, that's, that's gonna be happening. So instead of patients getting a product that is safe and that is accurate in, in terms of dosage, they're, they're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna get hit with lawsuits at the end of the day, I think. Th does that answer your question? It answers my questions, and are there anecdotes for what you're describing? I mean, I think that uh, recently there was a big article, right? I think that um, there was a recall because there was a pesticide contamination. Wow. And a certain lab had, you know, the, 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 the gov someone did a blind study on pesticide contamination and 
this one particular brand got hit because it did it, it was found that it did not have it did not pass pesticide um, analysis so they go back and say well this lab told me I passed but again there's no accountability so then it becomes a pointing of the fingers so that's a, just the more recent sample, uh, example thank you okay let me ask you quickly uh, in order to to test a product what's that turnaround time like right now our turnaround time is 72 hours so three to four days okay and suppose in your when you're going through your testing you discover something that you just think is just terrible but maybe it, it's not identified what do you do I mean do you report that to the lab or what do you do I mean, if you as you're testing something you say oh my god it's got that mm -hmm. is not healthy that is harmful is there a, 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 a structured way that 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 we can guarantee that that's passed on to ensure that the public is protected yes so in Connecticut we inform the Department of Consumer Protection because again the, the results go both ways the results go to the production facility and if it fails it goes to the has to go to the Department of Consumer Protection hey Freddie Freddie hey, could you come on up I think we have another mic over here well, uh, uh, are there conversations going on in the in the county where it relates to things that could be done to tighten up the testing conversations that could be had with the state additional requirements that we might want to add that the state did not or yes that conversation is going on and we are actually talking to the labs to learn about best practices. We've been to Denver, we've been to Oakland to see how the labs are working and that conversation is happening. Okay, don't, don't go anywhere. So William, you wanna, just, why don't you just identify yourself and then go for it and we'll have some questions for you as well and then I'll take a few more public comment cards. All right, wonderful. Well, as mentioned earlier, I'm uh, William Waldrop, Chief Executive Officer of Evio Labs. Um, not, Jose did a good job overviewing kind of where the city is. I'm not going to repeat all of the, the key components. Um, what I wanted to mention is that we do have one operating lab in the state of California. We have four operating labs in the state of Oregon today. Um, Oregon, unlike you know, like California, even though it's not the size or the mass of California today, I mean, California is 10 times the size of the Oregon marketplace, um, there's a lot of key learnings that came from Oregon. Uh, when we first acquired our lab back in 2015 in Oregon, um, there were approximately 40 testing labs. And after the uh, pesticide recalls of Colorado in late 2015, the Oregon Health Authority, which manages the uh, pesticide testing labs, or excuse me, the cannabis testing labs in Oregon, uh, mandated all the labs put together a simple operating manual. We went from 40 labs to 27 overnight. And then as of... Why was that? That was because, as Jose mentioned, there were labs that were operating with either not the right level of personnel or not having the level of sophistication or not having the sufficient capital needs in order to operate a lab under really standard operating procedures. Um, as of October 1st of 2016, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, working in conjunction with the Oregon Health Authority, had mandated formalized testing requirements and testing standards for all of the labs to operate within the state of Oregon. And as of October 1st, 2016, there were only 12 labs that met standard accreditation requirements uh, for testing within the state. And they broke it down to very specific, whether or not you're accredited for sampling, whether or not you're accredited to just test potency, whether you could test for pesticides, residual solvents, et cetera. So they broke it down to the point of certain labs could even only perform certain tests because they passed to a certain level of proficiency. So, um, and I do understand from the learning process where Jose is at in, in, in Connecticut, because a lot of states don't have that level of sophistication. But the under ORLAP, which is a function of the Oregon Health Authority, uh, they oversee and manage all of the lab accreditation process. 
and they actually have standardized tests from groups like Emerald Scientific or Phenomena where you can go out and get blind samples and send it to the lab. And we actually, every six months, we have to actually go through a, a reaccreditation process. Well, it's every year, but every six months, we go through a recertification that we can pass each one of these to a blind sample. So if it's a pesticide or in a sample, they're going to be in there. We have to be able to determine to a certain level of quantification. So yearly you recertify? Yearly we recertify. And we have to pr prove our capabilities and competency through this accreditation process. And, you know, we talked about, and I appreciate, you know, 17025 accreditation, it, it, it's, you know, through ISO. It's very important that labs understand how to operate a lab and operate within laboratory standards. But taking this to the next level and ensuring that you can perform, you know, through these levels of proficiency is imperative for our labs, specifically when we're talking about safeguarding consumer safety. You know, last thing we need, we talked about Victoria earlier with Crohn's disease. I mean, you people with compromised immune systems. They can't afford to have any impure products, you know, ingested, whether they take it through, you know, the traditional smoking, through a vape pen, through any type of edible or oral, you know, tablet. Um, this product needs to be tested for consumer safety. So I do want to say that I believe, you know, and if we go back to the ACCL as that California commission body, they actually have all of their members every year recertify through the animal scientific test, which includes, like I mentioned, potencies, pesticides, residual solvents, the big three, to ensure that, you know, they're catching, their members have the technology, the equipment, the competency to determine and catch when there is a failure. So, um, and, but unfortunately right now as a state, as a county, there isn't a body that's mandating every lab follow these standards. And I believe there's a huge opportunity, going to Jose's point, that, you know, we need to implement these standards that every lab must follow to ensure that we have the proper consumer safety. Now, what are the, uh, you, you mentioned you had a, a California base. Correct. How does that operate in comparison to the Oregon shops? And well, yeah. are you aware of any testing facilities that are owned or have partnership uh, from the uh, minority community? Um, a, a couple of items. So, so one, when we acquired the lab in Northern California, um, and it was acquired late last year, um, uh, it wasn't performing at the same levels of Oregon. And it was a lab, as, as Jose mentioned, you know, had great customer relationships, long-term stay in the community, um, was testing to, I'm not going to say accredited standards, but to industry standards. So the goal being is that we're coming in and incorporating our accredited methods into this lab to ensure compliance and safety across the board. Um, as it relates to minority standards, I mean, the lab we have in, in, in Northern California was uh, woman-owned. Um, my business partner, Lori Glauser, who's with us today, um, she is, you know, point part, you know, joint venture partner with me at Signal Bay and Evio Labs. So, you know, we do have that type of disparity that's out there. Um, you know, as we look to hire resources within our labs, you know, we're looking for diversification to ensure a complete, you know, uh, a complete balance within the organization. And uh, Jose, you said there are four, uh, that you have three of the four, I don't. Uh, what, production yeah, the, facilities. Production facilities yeah. in Connecticut. So how many do you work with? Um, right now, we, we work with about 300 different cultivation facilities in the state of Oregon. Uh, production facilities, about 150. Um, and, you know, cultivation Now, in Oregon, keep in mind, it's a much more mature market than, than Connecticut. Um, you know, right now, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission has over about 2,000 pending applications for licenses, um, of which there's, I don't have the exact numbers today, there's approximately um, 800 licensed cultivation operations in Oregon. Uh, today, there's about 400 production facilities that are licensed, and there's still a backlog of, of pending applications. So how do, and you that's get, how do you get how do you get your customers? You go uh, out, you <laughs> sales do a, the sale, You have a sales division. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to create an awareness, of course, the, of your existence. But more importantly, our customers continue to come back to us because of the consistency of the testing, consistency of the quality of the results. So if you have a production facility and they're anticipating it to be a certain percentage, you know, we use the scientific methods that are important. And then if there's a variance, you know, you have those dialogue conversations with your client to understand why are there variances. Um, you know, 
we're not, we're not always the highest potency group in the town. We always have the most accuracy when it comes to consistency of our reports. Um, as an example, you know, the last uh, potency round, you know, the, the target was 15.2. We ranged from 14.9 to 15.7, which is a very tight window around uh, an agricultural product. I mean, normally when you're testing something of this nature, you might see a 15 to 20% variance. That's just due to the equipment sensitivity. Um, but, you know, there have been labs, as um, Jose mentioned in the past, that come in at 18. And that's way outside of a standard line of deviation and should be an exception and should be, you know, investigated further. What's the population of Connecticut? About 3.6 million. And, and what's the number of, what, what do they call them, outlet, retail outlets? Uh, dispensaries. And how many within that total? Nine. So there are nine dispensaries in the entire state? Yep. Nine dispensaries and four production facilities. Where but the, 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 the program is very restrictive. Yeah, so they, don't, they don't have pain management as part of the conditions that are allowed um, by patients. So all the, the conditions that are allowed in the program are reviewed by a, me a medical board. The nine are where at? Are they spread out? Spread out? Yeah. Nine. nine. And how many million did you tell me? Excuse me? How many million? What was the population? 3.6. I mean, right now the, the patient count is, 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 is close to 20,000, I, I believe. Um, but it, it's, it's, again, it's due to the very restrictive conditions that are. I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. And that would not work here in LA. <laughs> no, I, that, that would be a challenge. Yeah. So if you guys can just sit tight for a bit, I want to get some more of the uh, public speakers. So if I could get Gilbert Mora, Melanie Cho, and uh, Noel, Marnie. Good to see you again, sir. I saw you. <laughs> Last week. Last week, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just uh, want to say I'm actually part of an agency that works contracted by the Department of Health. Oh. And so we do deal with this kind of stuff with the education, the, the stuff like that, behavioral services. But we're also part of a larger uh, coalition of agencies throughout the county called Rethinking Access to Marijuana, where we kind of gather the information and try to put it out there so people know what's going on. A uh, couple of meetings ago, maybe four or five meetings ago, I handed you guys out a little blue folder that had a lot of the information that you asked of him about the, the levels of teen use and things like that and how it's changed from when it first started to, to now and a lot of that stuff. But if you need it again... No, I think I can... I'll find out. Andrew, probably, we probably have that on file. Yeah, yeah. But, but if it, we need it, yeah, we'll... we'll get in touch with you. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, California has the HIDA program. I don't know if you know what that is. The uh, high intensity drug trafficking, whatever, uh, area. Um, they put out a report, too, in California that kind of broke down what, what the use rates and things were among youth and adults. So, mm. you know, there's a lot of resources out there. It's just a matter of getting them to you so you guys can actually use them. Well, I think we have a long way to go. I think oh, we're going to do, do the very best we can to get yeah. off to the best start that we can. Mm -hmm. But it'll be something that we will monitor and try to pro uh, improve upon, you know, on a regular basis. But again, good yeah. to see you again. Yeah. So and I recommend that you talk to SAPSI when you want those kind of stats. Okay. Uh, substance abuse prevention and control. You know, we. Where's Drew? Which, uh, SAPSI? Yeah. It's, it's a division of the Department of Public Health oh, okay. called uh, Substance Abuse Prevention and Control. Yeah, I want to make sure we have that. Okay. So where's Melanie, followed by Noel, followed by Lewis, Barry? Hi. Hi, my name is Melanie, and I'm with Behavioral Health Services. As Gilbert mentioned before, we are contracted through SAPC with the county, and right now we're actually doing community assessments in the county right now, and we 
are doing our assessments in the Hollywood community for youth and adults. So hopefully later on we'll get some conclusive data and information from SAPC, the County Department of Public Health. And I also want to ask Mr. Freddie Angie, I'm sorry, um, sorry about that, but with surveillance <coughs> that you spoke about, how does the county think, or is, how are they gonna go about that? How often are they planning on doing these, um, t not testing, but these community assessments for the community of, or throughout LA County? I think that's important to do it consistently, especially after 2018. Yeah, and that's something I'll, I think that's something uh, SAPS is working on. Okay. And uh, I, I will defer to them. All right, thank you so much. And you stay also stay there, part? Mr. Harris Dawson yeah. wants to ask you. So, uh, yes. can you say what your occupation is again? Pardon me? Your occupation? I'm a prevention specialist, outreach specialist. You're, so, so, you're an outreach specialist. So, SAPC, um, as I recall, uh, used to be ADPA, I think. Uh, they don't they collect data on usage and addiction and all those types of things on an ongoing. Have they been collecting that for like 30 years, right? The last time they produced data, I believe, was a couple of years ago. But right now, because of how the climate is has changed dramatically, yeah. and now we have legalization. They want to collect data again. So right now, we are collecting data since May, and we're going to end. Ah, data okay. collection at the end of July. Got it. Of course, that could change um, sure. once 2018 starts and licensing and whatnot begins to be issued. So okay. we're hoping that more data collecting can occur afterwards. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next, you Noel, right? So if I could get Lewis and then my man Patrick. Yes. So I have a question for the panelists from the Department of Public Health. So I recently read a fact sheet from the California Department of Public Health Tobacco Control Program saying that um, advertising on interstate highways of marijuana is will be restricted. However, I have a 42-mile commute through LA City and I still see billboards. How will that be regulated? And also, would regulation be extended to within LA City? Because I do know that families still drive through the city and there has been a huge advertisement across Hollywood Boulevard where they're shopping and also regarding the messaging that educational messaging for marijuana will they be targeted towards youth or adults or parents and also how will the messaging be dispersed will it be through agencies or television or other forms of media boy she sure got her bang out of that 60 seconds didn't she go right ahead Freddie Yes, the county is working on multiple medium to get that information out. And I know there's a, a public information group that is working on that as we speak. So I intend the question, would that be the whole county outside LA? Yes, uh, the outreach will be the whole county. And as I mentioned on that presentation, you know, the county is the health officer um, for the whole county. So all education will go across the whole county. And Part of the education will be targeted. So it will be youth, adult, it will be parents, and all that will, will happen. Are you done? Do you, did you have one more? It looked like you weren't. <clears throat> Go ahead. One. I just wasn't sure if you answered my question about the billboard advertising. Yeah, I, I think the billboard advertising, I don't know the answer to that as how they're going to do that, but we can look into that. Okay, thank you. Did you want to jump in, Mr. Harris? Yeah, I, I just, um, the billboard, most of the billboard restrictions, at least on alcohol and tobacco, are voluntary by the industry. Uh, they Either they agreed to it to settle a lawsuit or they just made a corporate agreement not to do it. So I, I'm just wondering, do you, does the county have any resources to monitor billboard advertising that you know of? I would think that would be part of the education, but I don't know how the monitoring will happen. Got it. Yeah. That's a good question, though. Okay, uh, Lewis. Yes, good afternoon, uh, evening. My name is Lewis Barry, and we work in the area of medicated topicals and sublinguals. Uh, a lot of these products are manufactured in different areas of the state, so therefore we need to have some sort of reciprocity in the testing 
whereas something might be uh, manufactured, let's say grown in Northern California, manufactured in Central California, and then sold in Southern California. So there could be multiple testing, but again, there has to be some sort of mechanized system where we can do everything uh, as a standard. And so I urge the council to, uh, uh, <coughs> to take care of provisions, to include provisions for that reciprocity between the different areas of the state. Okay, good. W William, yes. w how do you guys deal with that? Well, I mean, because you have, yeah. I can't remember how many facilities you told me you had. Well, we have, we have five facilities, four facilities in <coughs> Oregon, and, uh, and one in California as of today. Um, so, you know, in Oregon, of course, it's on a state basis. So, our customers, of course, the cultivators, the product manufacturers, distributors, and before the product can move any, through, anywhere through the supply chain, it must be tested and, and meet those certain standards. Um, part of where, um, and I apologize for not catching his name, but Lewis. Lewis. Um, part of where Lewis is at, and one of the things I do agree with is that, you know, any product that gets sold in the city of Los Angeles under Measure M, even in advance of the state finally getting their testing rules in place sometime in 18, as, as discussed earlier, um, we need to ensure that, that product is tested to the standards that the city of Los Angeles have incorporated. If you look at the cities of, of San Jose, you look at the cities of Berkeley, Santa Ana, Long Beach, they all mandate that any product sold in their dispensaries is tested. And what we need to ensure is identify what is that list of minimum subset of tests that are important for the protection and safeguard of the public. You know, one of the elements that we're very concerned about, and not to jump on Lewis's point, I'll get back, is that, you know, according to the state of California right now, they're talking about testing centers that could be as much as $400 a pound. Now, we know what that's going to do to the regulated market. It's, it's going to be non-existent. It's going to go back to the black market. We need to figure out how we can ensure that we have proper testing in place at a proper level to ensure the safety of the constituents in this community, but at the same time not pushing the supply chain back to where in an unregulated market. Okay. Louis, do you want to wrap it up with another question or yeah, something? Yeah, one thing to add to that is also fees uh, by each uh, locality or each community as far as testing is concerned. If there are testing facilities in different counties, they have uh, different cities, uh, these testing facilities can't be strapped by exorbitant fees in order to operate. And there needs to be some sort of system to make this reasonable because those fees obviously are passed on to the consumers, which needless to say will be paying a lot more, again, forcing people back to the black market. Thank you. Can Thank I you for your time. In, yeah. jump in here. Patrick, oh no, uh, Jose, jump in, yeah. and then we'll get to Patrick. Um, one, one aspect that I think gets misunderstood is that there isn't a need for an, a universal testing methodology for potency or for pesticides or for heavy metals or whatever. What matters is that whatever testing methodology that's being used by the laboratory has to be proven that it works. Mm -hmm. And that's what quality assurance comes in. I think that there's a lot of focus on trying to get a universal testing method, but that is, that is not where the efforts should be. It should be, we shouldn't be demanding all labs to be using the same method because then as a lab director, if I can make some process more productive, and I can maximize my, my time and my efforts, then I can pass those cost savings on to the consumer. So again, I think... So you're saying that, let's say, there, there should be an agreement possibly on what should be tested and the right. level, so, so but where it relates to the process. That, exactly, that, has, that, that is allowable in the science community with in in any area, I mean, again, it, it only it has to be proven it, that it works, and that's where again Got my it. recommendation of uh, the the either the county or the city doing those audits to make sure that the the, the testing methodology being used works. Again, this is where qua the difference between quality control and quality assurance. So, for example, ISO. Um, is the first line of defense that patients or customers can know that the testing method that is being used by Lab X is it actually works. And then you have your, your, um, your PT programs, for example, that, um, that, that, that reinforce that. And then you have your inter-lab 
um, testing that it reinforces that even further. So again, I think trying, trying to bind all labs to use the same testing method, it's, it's, not, it's not financially um, feasible for, again, for a lab to, to optimize methods that, that, that can potentially save uh, money and, and we can pass that, that cost savings to the patient. That's a real good point. Patrick, good to see you. You too, sir. Good evening, Chairman Wesson and fellow council members. As we stand here on the cusp of implementing rules and regulations upon the world's largest cannabis market, I would like to take this opportunity to express my concerns over the grandfathering in of pre-ICOs. If I have mentioned previously, it is my belief that the city is unknowingly awarding a monopoly to criminal organizations and thuggish operators. If this group is allowed to move forward, they will continue to plague the Los Angeles cannabis market. I suggest that you give zero preferential treatment to pre-ICOs. Short of this, I suggest that you keep these thoughts in mind as you review the so-called pre-ICO applications. Who really owns this business? How much money do they really make? How many times has this license or so-called license sold? Was that sale recorded and taxed? Is it legal to sell a nonprofit? More than anything, does the business meet all Prop D requirements? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, if there, does anybody have a question that they'd like to direct to either the health department or the testing people? Why don't you just come up right now? Cherie, I think I saw you raise your hand. I saw it. I see all. Come on. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Great. We, we were just there debating um, and making sure that somebody got up. So just logistically, um, we have a licensing process. We were wondering if it makes sense to prioritize testing and distribution centers so that they can be able to operate um, and sufficient time for this industry to move forward. The other thing is, you know, with all the different terms for testing and types of uh, elements that need to be considered, we need to have a great educational program for the community, for people who um, need to know what they're buying, as well as for the dispensaries and for the cultivators. And, and if we can have a work group around that, and some kind of economic analysis looking at the logistics of transportation as well as distribution and testing where it should go logistically to help move these products from one place to the other. So we're just thinking about those things. Thank you. No, that was good. How big of a facility, let's say the average testing facility is about what size? I'd like for both of you to tell, jump in, you know. Our testing facility right now is 2,800 feet. Uh, approximately at 25 to 3,500 square feet, just based on the size of that market. Are there any projections that uh, you might have where it relates to the number of, I mean, I'm sure you'd only want one or two, but I mean, I'll joke it aside, testing facilities that uh, would be necessary? Because everybody talks about we're the big state, we've got you know, 34, 35 million people, blah, blah, blah. So what, I mean, have you guys thought about that? I have absolutely. I mean, looking at the state of Oregon right now, I mean, the state of Oregon population is within the city of Los Angeles, I mean, on a comparison basis. The state of Oregon. Now, what is that population? Uh, Oregon. It has just here over 4 million individuals. So, and to give you some other numbers, there's 65,000 registered medical patients, about 400 licensed retail facilities, either selling medical or recreational. So, it was a very mature market. Somewhere where California is at a very mature market, of course, as you're moving uh, dispensaries from, you know, reg, uh, you know, uh, was it reg data, was it current, and so forth. Um, as we look at the number of testing facilities within the city of LA, you know, we'd be looking somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 10 to 12, just for the city of Los Angeles, based on the size of this marketplace. Okay. Jose, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, it, it all, it, I think it's, it's more on how many companies, because we, we like the idea of, 
if, if we're able to service um, Central California, Southern California, Northern California um, under the same Altasai banner, then then obviously that's that's what we're looking for. But um, again, it's to us is is not so much how many labs is more how many companies are able to 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 reach the standards that are set by the by the city state county how do, how is the product delivered to you or do you pick up the product and bring it back to your lab and how do we know that the product that you're testing is the actual product that's being sold to the public. So we have, so one of the, the, um, the hallmarks of the Connecticut regulations is that the testing laboratory has to do the sampling at the production facility. Um, so the, the production facility has to show us the, the, the product that they want so us to test. So you go to We drive the, to the okay. production facility we bring with, so we get a, um, a special license by the state of Connecticut that allows us to transport and possess medical marijuana samples. Um, obviously, in case we get stopped by the, by the police and they, actually, I've, I've been stopped once. <laughs> um, Slow <but> anyway. down. <laughs> um, so we go and test and, and sample at the production facility. We have a, uh, a manifest, a collection report that the production facility gets a copy of what we collected. We have a copy. And again, we, we both have that on record. And if the state of Connecticut, the Department of Consumer Protection at any moment in time, wants to verify that what was collected what is what actually is being sold, they, can, they, they have the ability to uh, compare the, the, the collection manifest from our end and the uh, production facilities end. Fred, you want to jump in before we? Yeah, I just want to add that the state proposal is, is the track and trace system is supposed to be a batch system where when they manif when they cultivate, they track it from the seed. As to the, to, yeah. So when they sample, it's supposed to be done by that batch with the tracking number. So when the lab, the, the proposal right now is either the, what the state is calling the, the lab agent would I come to the facility, distribute and take the sample, and it has to be recorded, or they can take the whole batch to the lab, and then the lab would take the sample that they want to test at the lab. That's the proposal right now. Okay, which is could change, but that's we. Well, we're very similar to what they mentioned, and actually, the one thing we discourage is our clients bringing large quantities, specifically of dry flour, to our facility. You know, not only the financial exposure, um, normally we, we, our laboratory facilities, we try and keep clean and sterile. So we do the same exact things that Jose talked about, using TNI standards, uh, transfer manifests. Our employees go out to, the, uh, um, to our client sites, whether it's flour or oil or, or even edible manufacturers, uh, do a random sampling in accordance to those batch standards, to the TNI standards, uh, get a certification between us and the client. That is what they're certifying. Uh, our, that information actually goes into the Oregon seed to sell tracking system. So by the time it comes back into our lab, we have to not only manually certify it's been received in, but we also then have to go online to confirm it's been received. And then once the tests are complete that were required for that suite of products, uh, and we generate our certificate of analysis, we actually put those results directly into that seed to sell system. So, so all interested parties, whether it's a dispensary, whether it's the uh, uh, state, local, or, or regulatory bodies, they all have, have access to that certificate of analysis to determine the end results of that test. Okay. What's, what's more, is, is one product more challenging than the other to test? Is edibles more difficult than ointments or oils or, or the, 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 to, the tobacco-esque types? Yeah, I, I would answer them. Jose might have similar or different answers to this. But, I mean, testing flour, testing raw oil, 
that's been extracted in a crude format is pretty standard, pretty simplistic. But when you start getting into manufactured products, specifically edibles, or there's gummy bears or chocolates or things of that nature, and usually at that point in time, and, and this goes back to some of the educational programs we've been talking about, that is, you know, you have to determine the homogeneity of that product, right? You've heard stories in the past where someone has acquired a chocolate bar. I mean, it should have been 100 milligrams, you know, and it's into uh, 10 little squares, and each milligram should have 10 milligrams. Well, old styles years ago, you know, man as product manufacturing has improved, they weren't able to homogenize that, that bar where you had a nice even spread of, of product, of, of oil, or of, 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 I guess, the, the, the oil aspect of it. Um, so one of the things that we do with our, our clients that are manufacturing these types of products, whether it's, like I said, it's a brownie or an edible or even a, a suppository or any type of oral tab, you know, is, is testing enough in that batch to ensure consistency and homogeneity that every time you're going to get a sample, it's going to have the same dosing. That's important. Um, the other thing that's getting really important that I want to talk about before you know run out is that as we get into the recreational side, we have to keep in mind we have a whole entire new user community that's going to be using this product for the first time. I mean, it's been medical here for over 21 years, and, and patients know how to self-dose, and they have very high tolerances. As Victoria talked about earlier, she's taking 100 milligrams. It may need more every single day in order to treat the symptoms or the, the specific condition they're on. But as we get into the recreational side, we really got to think about things such as like a Try 5 campaign where people are trying 5 milligrams and waiting 5 hours, literally, because they're not sure how a small little dose is going to impact them the very first time. So as we, you know, of course we're going to do things that are going to not orientate the product to, the, to, to youth, but when we get to the adult users who are out there, they need to ensure that they're taking the right amount for the first time so we don't have, you know, unexpected, you know, runs to the emergency room and things of that nature, which they end up having false alarms 99.99% of the time because they think they're having a panic attack when in fact they're just experiencing you know, cannabis for the first time and unfortunately have consumed too much. So as we start talking about education, uh, I agree 100%. We've got to keep the product away from the youth, no type of cartoon advertising. But we really got to also think about how we educate the adult consumer when they're, first, when they're experiencing this the very first time. We heard some very interesting stories early on from, I want to say, uh, Colorado about, the, in particular, the edible products, you know, and the delayed reaction in a person taking one and saying, hey, nothing, and then later on, you know. So look, Mr. harris do you have any other, any additional questions? Guys, again, I want to thank, uh, Fred? I, I just want, I brought the CEO, this is the Office of Cannabis <laughs> Management. Well, I, I met him, and I thought, I, I thought I was going to get him, yeah. but, uh, and, but you, you were great, it's, and I appreciate both of you. And I just called him up to make a correction about the timeline that you okay. mentioned earlier. Yeah. So Joe Nikita, Office of Cannabis Management. So in terms of the county's timeline, Freddie mentioned going into June, and we heard a collective groan from the audience. But we, our board expects us to track in terms of licensing the state's timeline. Yes. But because there's so much to do and so many regulations and education campaigns to roll out, we expect to work well into 2018 and 19 on I got you. Well, yeah, to, and, and again, I want to thank you guys for coming. But quickly, you know, before you were the director or the manager of the Office of Cannibal, Cannabis Cannibal, Cannabis Management, what did you do? And Freddie, what did you do prior to this, this new life? So I think, I think Freddie is Freddie. Is Freddie. He's the same as he's always been. He's just taken on a new role with, uh, with cannabis. But he, he is the branch director of, you know, food programs and... So this is just an addition to what you already do. So I, I was just curious as to how, uh, you know, well, what did you do prior? Well, before that, I was a land use lawyer for the county, so I represented the planning commission, okay. the board, and, and worked on land use, environmental, museums, arts commission, things okay. like that. Good enough. So look, I want to thank the audience for coming. Uh, thank Mr. Harris Dawson. I'll remind each and every one of you that I hope that within approximately a week or less, less there'll be a draft uh, ordinance. I don't want anybody to panic. Please contact us. Let us know what you think. Our neighborhood council, councils, we want to hear from you. 
homeowner associations, we want to hear from you, industry people, we want to hear from you, and then when we get towards the end of that period, we will reconvene and uh, uh, hopefully uh, be prepared to move forward with a, a workable policy. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming to the meetings, for all of the information that you shared with us, and we're going to do our very best to do this the best that we can. So, with that said, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.